Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander viewers are advised that the following program contains images and voices of people who have died. On October 14, you will be asked to vote yes or no to change our constitution. Do you want to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people through a voice to parliament? The Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, says this is a simple question, a matter from the heart. This is your time, your chance, your opportunity to be a part of making history. It will be a moment of national unity. But for many, the debate has been unsettling. We're taking 25 million people with us in this change journey. That's a lot of people. That's a hell of a big, you know, ask. This referendum won't change who we are. It will reveal who we are. Whatever the outcome, our country will be different on the Monday after. The ballot paper doesn't begin to capture the complexity of this conversation. We don't need to embed this in our constitution in such a way that it creates a rift. You know, you're going to have a large part of the population now seen as an isolated group of people with privileges that the other people don't. We live these issues and are impacted by them daily, whatever they may be. Child protection issues, uh, justice issues, youth detention, youth incarceration, housing, it does not make sense any longer for others to be making those decisions without us. This is the colony. We are a dumpster fire. The idea that the people who stole this land and then those who have directly benefited from it are now going to a referendum to think about recognising the people who they stole it off is insane. I'm heading to the far west, northern tip and east of Australia to hear how First Nations people are dealing themselves into democracy and if the voice can deliver on its commitments to address the disparities some Indigenous people face. How do you think Australians are going to vote in the referendum? Just anybody's guess, I suppose. I've been coming to the Gama Festival in Arnhem Land for years. It's one of those rare occasions in Australia where Indigenous affairs are front and centre. It's a cultural festival, but also a lobby fest with a powerful mix. This year, it's all about the voice. This is the first Gama without Yunupengu. He was the head of the Gumach Nation and the major force behind reviving constitutional recognition for First Nations people. Today his words will echo in those songs.
Across his life, Yunupingu had the ear of the powerful and used it to advocate for First Nations people. Hence, at Gama last year, after the announcement there would be a referendum on a voice, he had a simple question for the 11th Prime Minister he had dealt with face to face. Are you serious this time? The answer was a straight, yes, I am. The question that Australians will be asked at this year's referendum will read, a proposed law to alter the constitution to recognise the first peoples of Australia by establishing an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. Do you approve this proposed alteration? That's the question before the Australian people. For some, it's a modest, simple request. Yorta Yorta man Ian Ham is a member of the Stolen Generation. Adopted as a baby, he didn't know his birth family lived just 50 kilometres down the road from the country town he grew up in until he was an adult. For me, it's not about the Uluru Statement. It's not about sovereignty. It's not about advocacy. What do you as an Australian believe in your heart of hearts when you vote? Should the Aborigines, your fellow Australians, be able to speak? I use the term Aborigines because the way the discussion has been happening about this referendum, there are days when I'm not sure if it's 2023 or it's 1963. <laughs> Ian is the director of the Australian Institute of Company Directors, one of the many corporate groups that make the journey to Gama each year. I am God hoping it reveals that we are a nation that's maturing, we're progressing, we're coming to terms with our own history. I don't actually accept the argument that you know, companies and business should stay within the swim lanes and just look after their, their business. We all exist um, in a context. Ian has spent his adult life working to reform the systems that govern Indigenous people's lives. If Aboriginal Australia is fully embraced, think of the contribution we can make not only about ourselves, but to making Australia a better country as a whole. That's what this referendum is about. So much more than just closing gaps. The official no cap argues the voice will divide the country. So when you hear your name, that's your cue to stand up. But there's also resistance from those who say it's too small a request. People like Gunai Kurnai man Ben Abadangelo, a former professional cricketer whose view on the voice has moved from a reluctant yes to a hard edged no. Ladies and gentlemen, will you welcome Dan Borsha? Give him a big round of applause. Well, it's born out of what's acceptable for constitutional conservatives. It's not born out of black ambition. What do you say to those who say that this is a, a step in that journey of a rights agenda? It's not, and we don't have time. This go slow incremental change is killing us. Baby steps, a first step, like how mediocre is that? 235 years plus of brutal subjugation. I don't want to take a small step in quicksand with my feet tied together. I want to lift us up out of it. I want to dream and remember what it is like to live freely, autonomously, independent. And, um, you know, I want to maintain my dignity in, in pursuing that. Bunaba woman, Social Justice Commissioner June Oscar hopes the voice will limit Indigenous people being used as a political football. We must remind ourselves that this has been a journey. This call has come from decades upon decades of so many Indigenous leaders and we have had some of our best minds, Indigenous and non-Indigenous people, contributing to that. But politics has been everywhere in this debate. 
And the Yes campaign has a hard road to sell its case. For a referendum to pass, it must be supported by a majority of voters nationally and reach a majority in at least four states. But both sides are fighting for people's attention amidst the cost of living crisis. Walgett in remote northwestern New South Wales is among the state's most socially disadvantaged towns. But its residents are about to get a prized delivery. Gamilaroi couple Gary and Jenny Trindle organised this delivery of fresh fruit and veg. And so who do these boxes go to? Whoever wants them. Anyone in the community that wants them gets them. Yeah, it's important, isn't it, community? It's very, very important when you've got a little rural place like Walgett. It's very, very important that we do everything together and we work together. I think half of us going to get the bread. You want my truck? Gary is the chair of the Murtipaki Working Party in Walgett, an Indigenous organisation that practises what he calls turn-up democracy local solutions to meet the community's needs. Parallels have been drawn with how the voice to parliament could work. 16 working parties within the Muddy Parky Regional Assembly. and It's a collection of people from all the little communities out here. And the chairperson goes away three times a year to the Muddy Parky Regional Assembly meeting. Our chairperson is there. We tell him what's going on in our communities and what we need then he goes and lobbies government for us. And I'm the chairperson, but I don't do anything in this community unless the community tell me to do it. Right. Any mandarin, please? Apple? I'll get that one for you. Thank you very much. No worries. Enjoy. Thank you. That'll keep you fed for a little while. Oh, really hard at the moment. I've got myself as a diabetes and my son diabetes as well. Yeah. And fresh fruit and veg is really important. Yep. So what happens when you can't get that or you can't afford that? Well, we'll try to make do what we got. It's a really a bit hard. We've got one IGA uh, store here and they have to charge through the nose with their prices, which is not their fault. It's the way of living these days and the costing. Does this make you feel like you're part of the community? Of that, because the whole community's been invited down, you know, and that's the great thing about it. It's not just for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. It's for everyone. And uh, it's nice to see other people coming here. Gary's taking us on a tour of Walgett, the town he's called home for the past 40 years. There's a lot of people out there less fortunate than us. Haven't got the drive that me and my family have got. And they're the people that we need to help. A lot of people fear to come here because it's got a bad reputation. Back in the late 80s, I was an ACLO with the New South Wales Police. Yes, it was a violent town, but now there's no one on the street. You know, it might be an odd kid, but that'll be about all. So from the reputation that it had to what it's got now, I feel is really a credit to the Walgett people well, I'll be honest with you, I've had about three nights where I've had probably two or three hours sleep in the last week because I thought this wasn't going to go the way that it was planned. But to see it go off the way that it went off this morning, I, I think I've grown ten foot tall. You've seen it with your own eyes, like Walgett Police, Walgett Ambulance, Walgett Fire Brigade, and other people were just walking up to me and saying, Gary, can we help? I think it's brought this town the relations between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal, I think it's brought this town ahead 10 years. Really? Today, yep. Murtipaki serves a region that covers around 40% of the state, where more than 20% of residents are Aboriginal. Gary says Murtipaki knows what locals need and it delivers. So how does that line up with The Voice? This is the worst thing, Dan. They're trying to put something on us 
and not telling us what it's going to be. And I will not support that. I will not support people that are living in Sydney to make decisions for me and my family. Listening to you about Murray Parkey, I'm wondering, well, isn't that essentially a possibility to be a local regional voice that then feeds in? So issues that are coming out of Walgett come through you to your chair and then go to that's right. that national body. That's, that's exactly right. But your voice is only as good as the person that's representing you. What Gary hints at here is a recurring theme, a scepticism or lack of trust that the proposal would make things better. I'm sort of in between at the moment, but I think I'll vote yes anyway, because if we can make good changes, then so be it. If it's going to benefit our communities, then we've all got to be in it. And I'm even talking about non-Aboriginal people too. We've all got to come together, start telling the truth, about what's happened in the past, learn from it, go forward. Why is that important to tell the truth and to learn from it for you? Well, my father was taken as part of the stolen generation and it's still affecting our family. Twelve government houses have been built in the town for Aborigines and another 18 are to be completed and tenanted this year. Vic's story is the reality for many Indigenous families, where history is present every day. He was living on a mission with his parents, and he went down looking for turtle eggs to get breaky for, for the family, you know? And the coppers come along and took it. And that's why there's a lot of angst with, with police still today. You know, that, um, that blue uniform, it re represents a lot, and a lot of that's not good. It's only just now that we found proof that he was actually in Kinchilla Boys, huh? There was a lot of hurt for a lot of years because, you know, we didn't know what was happened to him in the past. And that really affected us as a family. The Voice debaters provided a platform for truth-telling about our dark past, but also stories of incredible resilience. So friends, we share with people, in the days of our ancestors, rivers were community that brought community together. On my side of the river where that cross is, around about 160 years ago, we have a massacre. So what happened was over 400 plus of our people were massacred for no reason at all. They were blamed for killing a man that wasn't even dead. Now, 1901, Australia became known as a federation of states, and all the talk of that time was Australia is now spreading its wings and it's expanding. While Australia was spreading its wings and it's expanding, for our people, it was shrinking. Now, if you look straight out, you can see uh, like a, a kidney-shaped storage tank. Come up and we'll do a bit more, eh? Get your phones out, because this is the best spot. Nyemba people date these fish traps to the time the land was created. Generations of Nyemba and other language groups have used and cared for them for thousands of years. I think it's sort of coming to me that a lot of what the Europeans did to the Aboriginals was actually taking their culture away. You know, it wasn't just accidental. They obviously, what Bradley said, um, you know, changed their location and stopped them practising hunting and gathering. So it was a deliberate attempt to um, wipe out their culture. So the fish traps originally went 60 metres back up past that weir. Our people would use that rock to sharpen their tools and weapons for hunting. See that flat rock down the bottom here? We're having a big national conversation right now about our past, how we reconcile that and understand that now. I wonder where do you sit on, on The Voice? I feel um, ignorant. I feel that I really have no idea what I should vote because there doesn't seem to be a lot of detail. I hear of Indigenous groups who are really for it, others that are dead against it. Um, and I really just don't... I don't know what I'm going to vote. 
because I don't feel that I've got enough information. Mm. Um, I think it's important, but I don't know what the right thing to do is. What happens the day after if the vote is incredibly close or it's not what we expect as a nation? Mm. Well, that's, that's a really a good question. Part. <laughs> yeah, that's a really hard question. Um, I mean, it does seem that there is an element of divisiveness in the whole thing at the moment. It's not sort of bringing people together, it's um, you know, sort of driving a wedge. I think for me, I'm definitely going to vote yes. Um, I'm quite passionate about it. I'm hopeful that it will be a vote for yes, and I think that it would be a really monumental um, change for Australia and it would be a good step forward in reconciliation. And I think enshrining it in the Constitution allows that it will continue despite what um, politics plays or what Parliament um, does, and I think that that is going to be a really big change. Here, like so much of Australia, people are focused on the day-to-day -day of life, paying the bills, getting the kids to sport. Mum and Dad had their first five children of the ten children that Mum ended up having. And that's where we lived, um, on, on, the, on the river bank. I've had ten children, five boys and five girls, and I've got 120 grannies and great-grannies and great-great-grannies. Even now, like, I'm, I'm semi-retired. Really Nyemba woman Grace Gordon has lived in and around Brewarrina all her life. We were actually all came under the Aboriginal Protection Act um, at that time, right up until 1969. lots of different Aboriginal... Grace found her voice in social welfare reform, establishing women's safe houses. She's had a lot of frustrating experiences trying to get support for local solutions. It's left her with a strong suspicion of government and its structures. I'd like to welcome you to my country, which is Nyimba country, and I'd like to pay my respects to our elders, past and present, and our young and emerging leaders that are coming through. Oh, thank you so much, Grace. So I was actually involved in this for quite some time around the establishment. It was the first women's safe house model, which is a different model to the normal women's refuges. And we had locations in Lightning Ridge, uh, Walgett, Brewarrina, Burke and Wilcannia. It was very personal for me, you know. Um, I, I myself, you know, was a victim of domestic violence and when that was happening to me, we didn't have these types of services out in these remote communities. Our women didn't really want to be, you know, putting their men in jail. They didn't like the violence, they wanted the violence to go away. So we thought if we developed a model like this, when the women knew that things were going to start to escalate, that the women could ring and say, you know, we'd like to come in for the weekend. So you broke rules in order to protect women? The policies and guidelines around places of that size was that you could only take at any one time six or seven people. And as you know, many of our First Nation families, there could be one woman that's got that number of children. We did. We, 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 we broke the rules. If we needed to bring in ten women, we would bring them in and they'd sleep on the floor. As the chair of Murdy Paki and Brewarrina, Grace can see Indigenous voices need to be heard by decision makers, but is skeptical about what an enshrined voice will deliver. But if there's um, some artefacts and things that can be taken from there, could be put um, maybe in a museum or keep in place. So I would like to see more of people from our remote communities being, I suppose, involved in the hierarchy, if you want to call it that to be able to take our voices really to the table to get some real traction and real outcomes. To be devil's advocate, is that what a voice to parliament is? Well, it's, well, that's what they're perceiving it to be, but I still don't see that it's 
in what we see as a real voice to Parliament. There are roadmaps everywhere with answers to local problems. Have a beautiful day at school. No. Off you go. <laughs> Nyemba man Jason Ford has wrestled with the best way forward. My position on the voice of parliament is uh, I've been directed by my direct elder um, to vote no, um, and that's it, it's finished. That's, uh, once my elder tells me uh, something, I've got to respect what they say. Regardless, I don't ask questions about that. Has that been complex or tough for you because well, I, I know that you're a, a yes supporter. Yeah, yeah, well, I, look, I, look, I suppose, you know, like, it's, it's, today is pretty complex, you know, and it's something of me being able to showcase to my nieces and my nephews and that uh, allows our family group to showcase, you know, that we still have that continuity to our new bar culture and our elders. You know, I've just got to respect my culture and my elder and that's just the way it is. How are you going to feel the day after the referendum? I'll feel for the people that have worked so hard to try and improve things for the people. I'll feel for them if, if it doesn't get up. And, um, and I'll be happy for them if it gets up. It's, it's the same point. You know, if it gets up, I'll still be happy for them because I respect what they've done. I just hope it doesn't change the way that people treat us in a negative way. I hope it's a positive outcome. And um, either way, either way, On the other side of the country, in northern Western Australia, other issues are muddying the waters. Northern's a great place. We've got Valadong history here for over 40,000 years, and we've got European history with almost for 200 years. This is a beautiful mural here. Oh, it's absolutely fantastic. Done by Jackson Stone, well-known artist. Chris Antonio like is Northern's Shire president. Shire president. I grew up on a farm out of town, so you're a little bit isolated from everything. To be honest, I think it was a racist town, but I think that wasn't from any malicious intent. It was just from ignorance. People didn't know our history. It wasn't taught at schools, and we just didn't know. And that was a lot of the population. This is a big weekend for the town. Today is the start of the Avon River Descent, an annual two-day race from Northam to Perth. I hope that you have an amazing race. You are part of history. This is the 50th Avon Descent. The Avon Descent is a community event, and Noongar elder Rani Pat Davis is here to bless the river before the race begins. When we go for a swim or anything, we think we always throw sand into the water. And that's to let the rival know that we're going into his domain. No one knows what he's looked like. It's just a, like a rainbow serpent. And he lives in this river. If you've done the race before, I wish you the best. If it's your first time, good luck. Three, two, one. We've worked really hard on embracing our cultural heritage and we've also made it possible to be comfortable to have uncomfortable conversations. Northern's maturing debate made it ready for the voice proposal. Then earlier this year, the West Australian Government introduced new legislation aimed at protecting Aboriginal cultural heritage. It was meant to prevent the type of destruction mining company Rio Tinto caused in 2021 when it blew up Dukin Gorge 
erasing 46,000 years of Indigenous heritage. But the new laws made no one happy. Show their interests and concerns. And the government and repealed them after only five weeks. It was never the intention. The, the failure of the new laws has cast a shadow over the voice debate in the West. Please show some respect here. Look for the balloon stall on the Avon Mall and Northern on the up. Nationals Member of Parliament for the Central Wheat Belt, Mia Davies, is a Northern local and a member of Western Australia's opposition. Very early on in the piece, I could see people linking the two, and I tried very hard to make the point to the government that the way they were going about it was, was creating confusion and chaos and setting people against uh, the, the broader debate around the voice. That was dismissed. Uh, we were called racist in the debate. We were um, told that we were conflating the two issues, but we could see that was happening on the ground, in the community, and it was making it harder to have those conversations, without a doubt. Some people play on that politically. I was trying to actually keep the two issues separate. Tony Seabrook farms upriver of Northam. In his role as president of the WA Pastoralists and Graziers Association, Seabrook was instrumental in the campaign that overthrew the cultural heritage law. Our family's been here since day dot. Our family cleared the country. I have a very deep sense of attachment to my piece of country. It was a mound in the ground when I was a child. As Tony shows me around his property, he notes the hardships of early pastoralists. That family uh, had a child that was scalded. The child died on the way to town, and they buried that baby just outside the walls of the house. Yeah. That place where that house was, where that baby, that, that child was buried, is that a special place? Have you protected that? I have never been there without thinking of what's here. So I could take you to within a very close distance of where the child is buried. But unfortunately, the ring, ring of stones that were there were taken away. His feelings have parallels with how First Nations people in the West regard their sacred sites. Do you know if there are any First Nations sites of interest on, on your property? Dan, I have been over every inch of this farm, and I could tell you right now, I haven't found a single thing that would indicate that there had been any Indigenous presence here at any time in the past. I couldn't find one. Mm. I'm an absolute advocate for the preservation of heritage, but this concept of um, mythical serpents and woggle, I start to have a problem when this cultural belief impinges upon uh, the sorts of things that I, as a farmer, I need to do, and I'd encompass that with everybody that owns land. The Heritage Act roused campaigners such as Tony to insist their concerns be heard. Your organisation, the WA Pastoralists and Graziers, Association has a voice to Parliament. You're incredibly influential. Do you see a parallel well, between what the voice would be trying we to do? We have a... We fight. We fight for every inch of, of, of airplay and influence that we have. Isn't that what a voice to Parliament would be? A place where Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people can have the fight so that they're heard the way that you are? I don't think anyone can say no one's listening. Everybody is listening. This is a tokenistic gesture that won't change anything. Mia Davies led her party when the WA Nationals decided to back the voice proposal the same week the federal party voted to oppose it. I was heartened that our party was prepared to have that debate and that there were people that wanted to see change in the way that we did Aboriginal policy for the betterment not only of Aboriginal people but for our whole nation. She's concerned that the Abandoned Heritage Act has cast a shadow over the voice debate. There's no doubt that the Aboriginal Cultural Heritage Act has made it more difficult for people to consider what's being asked of in the referendum, um, and that's really disappointing. Last month, the local party fell into line with the federal no position. 
you and I have talked about some of the really intractable challenges that some Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people face. One of the reasons used to justify the voice is that there needs to be a new way of trying to deal and address those matters. We need to address this, but we don't need to add it to the Constitution. This is a simple thing. The legislation is there today to do that. There's nearly 5% of the federal parliament that is Indigenous. The population of Australia that deems itself to be Indigenous, a bit over 3%. They're not unrepresented. If anything, the people that represent them and call themselves Indigenous are letting them down. What do you mean by those that call themselves Indigenous? Well, there's a big problem here. You know, you've been up north and, and you clearly know what someone that is Indigenous looks like, but we don't have any way here today in Australia of saying if someone says they're Indigenous, that's it. They are. But there's a three-point test and there's... Is anyone going to contest that? Is anyone going to contest the fact that, that someone calls themselves Indigenous? I think it's challenged every day. I make the simple argument that what we're doing now is simply not working and I've seen that in every corner of Western Australia. And we will only get one chance, I think, to... Uh, recognise Aboriginal people in our constitution. Yes, yes, I will be voting yes. From seeing our first athletes coming across the line. After two days of racing, the Avon descent ends here in suburban Perth. Competitors are spent from the effort, but if it's a metaphor for the voice campaign, it ends there. That result is still far from clear. So I've never proclaimed, and I, I don't have a decision of yes or no, I want to see more information so I can make my mind up when I think it's relevant and all the information's in front of me. If the Cultural Heritage Act is a lesson in how not to do policy reform, examples exist of how to do things better. WA's Southwest Native Title Agreement, known by many as the Noongar Treaty, shows how real consultations can lead to tangible outcomes. Colin Barnett was the Liberal Premier who signed the deal. Noongar man Brendan Moore now helps ensure it delivers. It's not a, a small deal that was uh, negotiated. And I think it's a great pity now that we're finding with The Voice that it has turned into uh, a divisive political debate. Um, I think that's very damaging. We have to look at what's at stake. And things like The Voice, it, it it's, it's really is a simple advisory group. And as we've seen in the southwest of Western Australia, we've got what is essentially a treaty and the sky hasn't fallen in. We actually were the first nation in Australia to win native title in 2006 over a capital city. Our sites and our artefacts have been covered by a European cover, but it's still just beneath the surface and you don't have to scratch very far. 90% of Western Australia's population live on Noongar land. Only a handful of years ago, an entire skeleton was discovered underneath a Perth suburban footpath, complete in the crouched position facing the sun, which is a traditional ancient burial custom of the Noongar people. The Noongar people number around 30,000, one of the largest cultural groups in Australia. In 2016, they surrendered their native title rights in exchange for resources and recognition negotiated with government. And I was incredibly impressed with the courage of the Noongar people to make that decision. At the heart of it was the fact that the Native Title Act was going to deliver ancient rights. You know, that's the right to hunt, uh, the right to gather and the right to collect ochre. And it was on slithers of land that was left over by agriculture, left over by industry uh, and that government didn't want. We were better served by an alternative settlement that would make us engage into a, a modern economy. We're an herbalised people from an ancient culture. Cultural heritage assessments like the one Brendan is doing here preserve Noongar culture for everyone. 
So while I'm grinding, what am I looking for if I see anything? We're looking for artefacts. We're looking for any sort of cultural material from the old days. Tony Seabrook's property is on Noongar country, but was not affected by native title. Hardly anyone knows anything about it at all, but it was signed over during the last years of the Barnett government, a Liberal government in Western Australia. $1.3 billion worth of uh, transferred wealth there, 200,000 square kilometres of land, and probably encompassing about 30,000 people. This is, this is a huge decision to have taken by government and, and a very empowering thing for the Noongar people. What were the prevailing politics for you at the time? Certainly a motive for Aboriginal people. It was a big deal. A lot of people said to me, it's taking a long time. Five years of negotiation is a long time. Uh, my response was, understand, for Noongar people, this is the one roll of the dice. It was very well thought out, very detailed, um, and expensive, but worth it. I think that time has, has sort of healed healed a lot of people. I'm sure there's, there's still a lot of people that um, are sad about, about the um, surrendering of their, their inalienable rights. Uh, however, a lot of people have come to realise the benefits that we're now seeing from the Noongar Budget Trust. Uh, we've now got a, over $180 million in the trust. Wajak U Edward Dandy Noongar man Brendan Moore and Colin Barnett agree the South West Settlement offers a lesson for the voice debate. And can I ask you, what happens the day after the referendum if it's a successful outcome? Well, I think, I think it'll be a, an amazing moment. It'll be an amazing moment for the country. Uh, and it'll be a, an amazing reconciliation moment. Aboriginal people asking for this. It's, it's not a political party asking for this. So it'll mean that Aboriginal people feel heard immediately. And I, I think that's a wonderful moment. What happens the next day if Australia votes no? I think it'll be a very difficult time for all of Australia, but particularly for Aboriginal people. Um, I will vote yes, but I do so with doubts because of I, I, would, I think the question is flawed. But I will vote yes because I don't want to stand in the way of the aspirations of Aboriginal Australians. Whatever path Australians travel to reach their answer, the outcome will play out here. The ballot paper isn't big enough to contain all the questions raised in this debate, but whatever answer it does deliver will set the foundations for the next steps as a nation. I think we are set either way for some bad times ahead, but I think it'll be a regenerative moment. And if that no vote comes through and, you know, a bushfire will come through and it'll ravage the entire scene, but, you know, you come back to that site six months later, 12 months later, and you see that green bursting through, settle the business, settle the score. It feels like we have this great opportunity now we are capable of getting it right now. So I'd like to think that we can address this now in our generation and not leave it for our children and grandchildren to struggle with. It's going to do more harm than good. Let's just work out a way to resolve the issues that are there and put the referendum to one side because it's just, it's not going to end up happily for everybody. It just won't. Twice in my lifetime, my countrymen will get to judge my worth as a human being. That is heavy, heavy for us, but it's a heavy thing for the rest of Australia to think about, and it's got to think about it seriously and not with these superficial distractions that are happening. From the yes and no case.